And this is the key to it all. The, the key to it all is nobody, nobody in the West, but certainly, but also nobody in Russia can afford to have an irrational leader uh, with his finger on a nuclear button. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen and today I'm delighted to be joined by Roger Boys, columnist and diplomatic editor for The Times. He's the author of 12 books and has spent almost 50 years as a foreign correspondent. Roger, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to Frontline. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. I wanted just to start by talking about a really interesting piece you wrote recently for The Times, comparing... Well, the lessons from ancient Rome with what's happening at the moment in Russia and also in Israel. Can you just give us an insight into some of the arguments you made in that piece? Well, um, well, first of all, uh, I went to an exhibition which is amazing and should be visited by everybody, really, in the British Museum about the Legion, the Roman Legion. And you can learn, apart from really sort of freaky uh, exhibits like, you know... Uh, the remains of crucified soldiers and 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 the red socks that they used to wear with their sandals and you know all these extraordinary bits of of life they teach you an awful lot about how modern armies were set up and how they operated um and whether they were effective or not um because the roman army uh was the first modern army it was set up by emperor augustus and um, uh, modern in the sense of being professional, uh, but also uh, in terms of internal discipline and um, um, and in tactics. So uh, it's quite a useful benchmark to measure today's wars. Uh, and that was my starting point, really, how to look at um, what's going wrong in today's wars, uh, what the, the forces that are driving the internal operation of, of wars. And, of course, there are loads of wars going on at the moment. Um, uh, some are civil wars, um, but, they're, uh, but some of the most complex um, affect uh, the most um, esteemed, in a way, or at least most feared armies in the world, uh, namely... Uh, uh, Russia and Italy, uh, Russia and Italy, um, uh, and Israel. Uh, Russia and Israel, yeah. Um, uh, quite different wars in their way, but also um, full of flaws, um, full of tactical successes, but also strategic blunders. Um, uh, you know, full of uh, uh, internal discontents within the army arguing generals, uh, gen that's to say generals are arguing with political uh, decision makers. Um, and uh, uh, it, it just seemed to me a very useful way of, of, of looking uh, or giving a historical perspective to what seems to us, really, newspaper readers, as being uniquely troubled times. Um, they are special times, uh, they are anxious times that we're living through, but, but uh, you can find ways of, find ways through this, you know, through all the conundrums that have been uh, raised by, um, by these wars. That's a really interesting point, and I don't mean to get too depressing too early, Roger, but, but actually I've, I've heard people talk about the fact that we've almost become maybe too comfortable with a state of relative prosperity and relative peace, which we've thankfully enjoyed in the West since the Second World War, largely. But actually, if you look through the grand sweep of human history, a state of conflict is the more normal state of being. Yes, we... Um, well, first of all, don't be worried about being uh, anxious and, and gloomy. Uh, in fact, my nickname in the office is Dr Gloom, yeah? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm used to all this kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, yes, I mean, we... we uh, it, there was a period of self-delusion after the communist system broke down in 1989-1990 when it seemed to Western strategic thinkers um, that uh, this was a historical turning point, not just for communism, but... Um, uh, but for Western values and uh, the notion of war, uh, it seemed like the old-fashioned war uh, had come to an end. 
And now it was all about cooperating in ways to avoid war and increase prosperity. Uh, that's to say capitalism had somehow won over uh, communism. Well, that didn't last long. Yeah? It didn't last long because it had underestimated the power of nationalisms. Um, uh, it had underestimated the power of military machines to carry on uh, inventing wars in a way, um, uh, even when objectively it looked like uh, it was going to be an era of peace. Um, and uh, as a result, in the West, we stopped investing in defense. Um, and, um, you know, the letters editor can tell you how many letters he gets from uh, people who say, you know, this was this has been the cardinal error of the last 30 years, that, mm. that um, we've underinvested in, uh, in defending ourselves against attack. In or underinvested in making our societies resilient against attack, um, and um, I've you know I've shared those opinions for some time. You know I was a reporter during the breakdown of communism, long before 1989. You know I was in Poland in the 1980s when the communists had to impose martial law. You know. Um, uh, in Moscow in the 1970s, you know, when it looked like communism would carry on and on and on. Um, but uh, so so I have this, but I too thought, well, maybe this is the big turning point. You Did know? you, because of course, was it Francis Fukuyama who famously wrote The End of History or was yeah. quoted as, as almost implying that at, at the fall of the Berlin Wall? Did you almost fall for that yourself, Roger? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I struggle to understand what that really meant. Um, he seemed to mean that it was the end of um, uh, the ide ideologization of uh, world politics. Um, and he was kind of right about that. I mean, we didn't have to worry about what the Politburo was up to and, you know, all these kind of... and this. Um, uh, but but now we do worry about all these things. We worry about the Chinese Politburo for a start, uh, because that remains a communist uh, managed uh, society. Um, no one could pretend that it was anything close to a democracy. Um, and as I say, uh, it was clear to me really from the beginning, um, uh, you know, doing the Balkan Wars, for example, that nationalism was back with a with a vengeance that had never gone away, and was going to be the source of conflict um, and atomization. You can see you could see the Soviet Union was breaking up, Yugoslavia was breaking up. So, and it wasn't breaking up in a nice way; it was breaking up in an ugly way. Um, so, uh, uh, so at that stage, we should have been thinking really hard about investing in defence, and we didn't. Just to go back to the comparisons between ancient Rome and what we're seeing today, of course, a comparison that has been made is between Vladimir Putin and Caesar. And I suppose you could say that we're waiting for a, a Brutus-style figure. Some thought maybe last year it might have been Yevgeny Prigozhin. Do you still think that when the time comes that Putin is removed from power or leaves power, it'll be because of an internal challenge to him? Uh, yes, I'm pretty certain about that. The question is really what coalition of... of opponents has the has the power and the opportunity to do that uh, Prigozhin was too isolated a figure to do it and he wasn't he was a spokesman in a way for a certain level of discontent within the army and uh, the military security services the GRU but it, it he wasn't he didn't have a broad following and um, his he thought he had a broad following because he was successful on on you know Russian equivalents of of uh, YouTube and so on, and he basically ranted and and seemed to do so fearlessly uh, against the way the war against Ukraine was being run, um, uh, and he developed his own private business, you know, selling security in a way to countries like uh, to Russian clients like Syria. And uh, so he had a solid financial backing. He had some military backing, but it, that didn't add up to enough to, to push uh, Putin to one side. It made Putin worried enough to flee Moscow when he started to 
walk there, uh, <laughs> when he started to march there, I suppose. Um, but, uh, uh, but you, you know, there is, we're in this age now of, of self-extending autocracies, yeah, so, uh, and we're beginning to realise how extremely difficult and complicated it is to get rid of them. Um, but the assumption is, if uh, the Russian economy uh, starts to break, um, uh, that's been the, you know, the the starting point really of um, uh, of all the sanctions and Western uh, policies uh, in the wake of the Ukrainian uh, invasion. Uh, if that breaks, if if business leaders people we used to call oligarchs, um, uh, become less loyal to him. Um, um, and the military uh, feels it's disrespected by, by Putin and the close leadership around him. Then you crea you're creating a pre, um, pre-putsch situation, pre-coup situation. Um, and that will come. I suppose, but it's got to come with with obvious, explicit signs of weakness from Putin first, and so people start to doubt his rationality. Um, it, it's it's the, and this is the key to it all. the The key to it all is nobody, nobody in the West, but certainly, but also nobody in Russia can afford to have an irrational leader uh, with his finger on a nuclear button. And I just wonder whether we are starting to see those signs. It was interesting you wrote for the Times recently about Putin's response to the Crocus City Hall attacks in, in Moscow and, of course, the Kremlin's attempt, whether at the direction of Putin or not, to, to blame Ukraine baselessly for it and whether that, that maybe exposes Putin's state of mind and a potential friction there with the intelligence services that could in the long term undermine him. Yes, I, I think when you've been as as personally, day by day, hour by hour, involved in an intense kinetic war for as long as he has, uh, you develop tunnel vision. Yeah? Um, so it, it wasn't just... So when, when he immediately said, oh, it's the Ukrainians, he, it, it wasn't a thought-through uh, response. It was a reflex. It was a reflex which is... Um, uh, you know, Ukraine is the root of all evils. Um, it's and the war aim increasingly from this increasingly narrow, irrational Putin is uh, is the um, uh, is the annexation of Ukraine of of the whole of Ukraine. Even though he's always hushed that up, really. Um, uh, and therefore the extinction of Ukrainian culture or its subordination to Russian culture. So um, uh, so as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, of course, he's been irrational right from the beginning. Um, uh, because, you know, how can this possibly ever serve Russia's interests? Uh, even if he wins on the battlefield, how will Russia be better, richer, happier... Uh, as a result. Um, and these are the questions raised by Ukraine. These are the questions not being raised until now in Russia because uh, Russia is muzzled uh, by, you know, all the, um, all the forces that, that uh, Putin has at his disposal. We talked about the comparison between Putin and, and Caesar. I don't know if you saw recently, Roger, that he also directly compared himself to Jesus as well because he was giving a speech, I think, in the context of education and he said his mission of protecting Russian youth from Western culture and influence was equivalent to Christ recruiting Peter and Andrew to spread the word of God. Is, is that simply what happens with the dictators when they've been in power for so many years that they do become deluded? Uh, yes, although he started quite early with these delusions, uh, the sort of messianic, um, uh, the messianic route. Because don't forget, Ukraine is not his first war; it's not his, not his first rodeo. You know, um, he started off in power, crushing Chechnya, and in those days, his messianic role was to protect, supposedly protect, 
uh, Russian Orthodoxy and um, uh, Russian uh, nationhood against Islam. Yeah, so uh, so there was so the war against Chechnya, you know, a really small mountain uh, statelet, really. Um, uh, but you know, full of warriors, um, as mountain districts often are, um, it was was writ large as as Russia's war against terrorism and uh, and his duty then to save the Russian nation from the barbarians. And this is, of course, the Roman equivalent too. You know, the Rome Rome was based really. It stretched its empire, just as Russia has stretched its empire, on the basis that um, there were barbarians all around, you know, Scotland, for example, um, or if you've read Asterix, uh, Gaul, you know, or, you know, there were all these pockets of resistance to rational, supposedly rational Russian, uh, Russian Ro Roman um, uh uh, imperial control, um, and and so I, I, you know, so you could say that the Romans are the model, uh, the model for Putin. But probably it's more, uh, it's it's a little bit more complex than that, uh, because simply, um, uh, I mean, if if I was talking now to Vladimir Putin, God forbid. Uh, directly, he would say, he would repeat his line that the destruction of the Soviet Union was the, you know, the worst thing that ever happened in the 20th century. And he'd sort of, you know, ignore all the other terrible things that happened in the 20th century, and he would focus on that. So, so obviously, it's, it's he, he's motivated more by restor restoration of what was, um, in in a in a more or less recognizable form of a Russian empire, a, a post-Russian empire, than uh, uh, than defining defining the new world, which is what the Romans were doing. I want to come on to the situation in the Middle East very shortly, Roger. But but just on Putin, obviously he sees his war in Ukraine as almost a war against NATO. But does he want a war? with NATO? Because it seems to me that NATO leaders are very slowly edging closer to accepting that at some point in years to come, there will need to be a direct confrontation with Russia. Does Putin actually want that? Um, well, I, we're, we're down to the question again of whether he's a rational actor or not. But um, at the moment, what, what, we, we have this strange situation where... Um, uh, the West, at least under Biden, um, uh, is in seems to be in the business of self deterrence. That's to say, it um, is thinking twice at every stage before supplying some new weapon system that might seem to threaten the Russian motherland directly. Um, um, and uh, and it, also Biden but not just Biden, all sorts of other powers, um, are, of course, very nervous about, uh, uh, you know, Putin's uh, th threats or veiled threats to use nuclear weapons or tactical nuclear weapons. Um, so, so we are self-deterring, uh, uh, and it's a very complex position for uh, an alliance to be in. Um, and Russia, meanwhile, um, is also acting within certain red lines that it's defined for itself, but which it hasn't announced. So, so um, it, it's you know when um, uh, when Russian artillery shells aimed at Ukraine land in Poland, usually either by mistake or they've been perhaps shot down by Ukrainians and land on on inside Polish territory, um, then um, uh, there's this huge uh, process of, um, of reassurance coming out of Russia. I mean, 
behind the scenes and so on, and and uh, but also publicly saying essentially, this wasn't us or, um, you know, it wasn't meant for you. Anything really to avoid Poland, which was in the first stage of the war seen as perhaps the most trigger happy of the allies uh, bordering Russia or close to bordering Russia. Um, uh, uh, anything to uh, to stop them triggering Article Five, the one that you know, the clause in the NATO treaty that um, uh, uh, I, I was going to well, say requires that one essentially is an attack says on it's all, a yeah. yes, it's it's an attack on all, and uh, but doesn't actually stipulate what one would do in that mm. situation. Yeah, it's it's a quite a so even Article Five is full of ambiguities and and little little ways of stepping back. Uh, um, you know, you, you can... We, we've only really declared Article 5 after 9-11 um, uh, in kind of slightly weirdly in defence of the United States. Um, and, um, and that just meant all sorts of things. It meant we became tougher on letting people who could be terrorists in the future into our countries, you know. So it, it wasn't quite the same thing as being on on alert um, against, um, you know, some foreign power. So so it's, it's it, in other words, it's basically unknown territory. And Russia does, and Putin doesn't like that, doesn't like unknown territory. So he seems to hold back in certain moments. Uh, but that doesn't stop him carrying on doing all sorts of nasty things all around. It just means he has a word with his commanders saying, OK, don't do this, don't do that. Um, um, and um, it's dangerous, you know, it's just dangerous because there are so many ambiguities in, in this relationship. Times Diplomatic Editor Roger Boys is with us today on Frontline. I want to ask you, Roger, about the Middle East. Obviously, last week we had... A lot of news coverage here in the UK about the tragic death of these international aid workers, three of whom were, were British nationals. But it seems to me, I mean, leaving aside the human tragedy of what happened there, the more geopolitically significant airstrike last week was what happened with the Syrian consulate in Damascus with a suspected Israeli airstrike on it. Why do you think Israel chose to make that strike? Um, well, first of all, it's been making similar strikes for a long time um, and it's done so um, it, that's to say in Syria because um, uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard coordinate assistance for Hezbollah in Lebanon from Syria so it's it's the liaison um, you, I suppose you could call it a kind of fulcrum mm. uh, in 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 uh, uh, and an extremely dangerous fulcrum because um, this could be the next phase of the Gaza war. That's to say that it goes, it it then, there'll probably be a battle for the Rafa crossing in the south, but then the war might spread uh, to the north. Hezbollah might be activated by the Iranians. And uh, and then and this is the situation which Israel really does want to avoid because Hezbollah has a really significant uh, army, um, perhaps one hundred and fifty thousand people, and it's not quite in that sort of. It's not like Hamas with its kind of ragtag partisan kind of uh, partisan stroke terror uh, grouping. It's 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 really and it and it's stocked up with Iranian uh, hardware. So uh, so, it, so Israel struck then in part uh, in, in preparation for what might happen soon in, in Gaza. So that's the, that's the logical explanation. But it raised all sorts of interesting questions, which was, uh, and one of them was, how what you have to know about Syria is that Russia controls its airspace. There's nothing that Israel has been doing over the years to knock out Iranian revolutionary uh, guard arsenals or whatever over the last uh, the last few years that hasn't been approved by Russian by by the not approved but uh, 
you know, a blind eye is turned uh, when when an Israeli jet enters Syrian airspace. Um, you know, you've got Russian GRU military intelligence officers in Syria watching this, reporting on this, making decisions on this, and uh, uh, and it's happening. Yeah. So, um, so. So the question, so one of the questions arising from this was not just will Iran respond and how will Iran respond, um, uh, and it's clear that they will do something, but we don't know quite how. Um, uh, but also, where's Russia on this? You know, Russia and Iran are supposed to be in a line. You know, the, the Russian-Iranian relationship has changed since the beginning of the Ukrainian war because. You know, uh, uh, Russia. Uh, you know, Iran is supplying drones. You know, to to uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, Iran is supplying drones to Russia in a big way, um, and that means uh, you know that Russians and Iranian are coordinating at all sorts of different levels in in, in terms of intelligence and in training and and so on. You don't just end up being a major supplier in the middle of a kinetic war and not have that kind of relationship. And yet here we are, Israel was allowed to take out, um, you know, one of the most senior uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard officers. Um, so so people are trying to work, and, and the reason I'm, I'm not answering that question is because because my impression is that uh, intelligence services haven't worked that out yet yeah, either. The no one Western, really knows. No one re really knows what what shifted in that in that relationship, and we'll see partly now uh, when Iran eventually responds. Uh, the betting is that they will hit at maybe some Israeli embassy in South America or something like this. That 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 it will be an oblique response. Um, uh, certainly, security on Israeli uh, diplomatic uh, residences uh, across the world, including London, are, are really m massively on alert at the moment. Uh, it's it's you know even more than they usually are. So, uh, so I'm just trying to think whether I've answered your question. Or no, not. I, I think you have, and I think it's absolutely the right point to make that that I suppose we don't fully know, and we can't necessarily read what will happen next in terms of Iran's response. I just wonder as well, Roger, whether it is possible that part of the motivation for Israel making this strike on, on the consulate was to remind its Western allies that whilst there is a lot of legitimate criticism of what Israel is doing at the moment in Gaza when, when it's taking the fight to Hamas, that in essence that is not so much a fight against Hamas per se, it's a proxy war with Iran. And by focusing attention again on the Iranians, that just reminds America and the UK, that, that that is the wider context. Yes, yes, uh, that, that, I, I share that opinion completely. I, I mean, uh, it, uh, the Israelis are trying also to shape uh, the way that Gaza is seen, the Gaza conflict is seen in the eyes of the American electorate. Um, and the American electorate... Uh, it, 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 you know, as as far as Israel can control that at all, really, uh, it can control it by persuading them that Iran is 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 uh, you know they call it um, the octopus. You know, uh, that's to say, the the central brain uh, uh, is is the head, and Iran is the head of the octopus and the tentacles, which, by the way, I think. I'm not much of an expert in, in in octopuses, but I think each tentacle has its own own kind of nervous, independent nervous system. That's to say, if you cut off one of the tentacles, it can grow a new one. Um, um, so, uh, <laughs> without getting too tangled in in kind of Nemo like um, discussions, it that's the point. That this is the image you have to. You have to persuade the two candidates for American president is the correct one. That's to say, it's not just Hamas. Yeah, um, it's the 
It's the people who control the various tentacles that are being used to uh, squeeze the breath out of Israel. And, and that's... Uh, and it's, of course, it's, it's kind of tactical in the media age. It's tactical to say, well, yes, we, perhaps we're not behaving beautifully. Um, uh, perhaps we have committed errors... And, and so on, but look away from that for now because the the fundamental act that is prompting all this is October the 7th, uh, the atrocities, um, um, and who was behind October the 7th? Um, uh, because Hamas could not have constructed a... Um, uh, you know, it wasn't an act of anarchy, although it was you know, in its execution it was it was anarchic, but it was something that had been worked out. And, and the imp imp clear implication is that it was worked out in, in the knowledge of Iran. Um, Iran denies it, other people deny it, but that's clearly how it has to work. And the same goes for all of the proxies, the Houthis in Yemen, um, they were they were always new, you know. They they had their own tradition of fighting, and uh, 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 but Iran gave them the weapons, the training, and uh, and pointed them in the direction that was interesting for Iran. So the first thing, you know, long before the Hamas attack, Houthis had uh, hit a Saudi oil refinery with uh, with really quite sophisticated drone swarming uh, tactics and making a, making a complete fool out of Saudi Arabia, which spends billions and billions and billions on air defense. Um, so, uh, so it's trying to shift the debate a little bit. It's trying to shift the discussion. Um, uh, and it does, you know, Israel does invest a lot in... Uh, in lobbying uh, in in America, f exactly for this reason, it it wants to make sure that the debate doesn't move in the way that a lot of the uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party would would want, which is um, um, uh, you know arms embargo, um, uh, ceasefire, leading to peace agreement um, that sees Israel, uh, you know, uh, accept the notion of a two-state um, two country and, and an upgrading of the Palestinian presence. None of this Israel wants, and so it has to stop the first step. Um, and... Um, and that's and that's why these kind of acts happen. Yeah, I, you know, it would be madness to think that that uh, attack on an Iranian that assassination, essentially, of an Iranian general, is the last one. It's, it'll be part of a pattern now to just to prod the memory of the superpowers that Iran is a big problem, and it could be. And this is without getting too, you know, tangled up about this, but it could be that Russia also accepts this part of the uh, part of the message that that actually Russia um, um, is nervous uh, about groups like Hamas um, that it's not just because of its own restless Islamic things going on um, but also um, uh, because it, it for it it wants it wants a foothold in the Middle East, but it doesn't want a massive. It it doesn't want to clean up, clean up Middle Eastern wars. It knows that that's the route route to disaster for it. A couple of quick things to to round up. Um, Roger, first of all, do you think there is any scenario in which a US government or maybe slightly more likely a UK government would suspend the sale of arms to Israel? 
Uh, well, it looked for a while that we might go in that direction. Um, and part of the reason reasoning is that people are trying to... The Part of the reasoning is there are election campaigns across the world, yeah? And uh, no one has quite worked out um, what the impact of the mobilisation of young voters is, uh, especially in multi, uh, multi-ethnic societies, uh, of uh, televised and TikToked uh, and YouTubed uh, depictions of Muslims being killed uh, en masse um, uh, in Gaza or frankly anywhere but, but Gaza. And uh, it it does it does as we saw uh, under Jeremy Corbyn, for example, uh, have the capacity to bring people out on the streets and uh, and to make people care about politics in the way they don't much care about British politics, but they do care weirdly uh, about um, about these particular. Um, uh, atrocities. So people haven't quite worked out what you know where this leads. What what does it mean in terms of lost voters? Uh, you know, uh, you know, or or even in local council. You know, will it somehow help Sadiq Khan? You know, Sadiq mm-hmm. Khan doesn't doesn't it doesn't hold back from saying that, you know, uh, horrible things are happening in Gaza. So it comes down to politics because, you know, for, for many years the Jewish vote in America, for example, was seen as being very significant in, in America's military support for Israel. But yeah. if there's signs that suddenly electorally it's not in the interests of one or other party to, to continue funding Israel, that may shift. Yes, I mean, th- that's true too, that, that political constituencies are changing massively. So... Basically, the Democratic Party was always very supportive of uh, the state of Israel. But but you've got a f- now quite a large faction, um, judging by their voting uh, votes of condemnation of, of Israeli behavior, it, it amounts to 40, 50 people within... within um, uh, within the the party in Congress, so it, that's and that these are people who are quite loud, you know, and they're they're not just um, uh, the young, uh, you know, the young ones and the usual suspects. It's you know Nancy Pelosi, you know, mm. for example. Um, uh, people feel free to criticize Biden within the Democratic Party on on his, what's seen as his reluctance to condemn Israel. So, <laughs> so which brings me to to these to this sequencing, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, since a ceasefire doesn't have an immediate purpose and even critics of of uh, uh, Israel can see that it's not you know, it's not going to quite work. Um and that anyway, there's plenty of behind-the-scenes talks going on which might or might not make it happen. Uh, an arms boycott seems like an easy easy win. Um, and it, in particular in Britain, it seems like an easy win because we, we supply almost no weapons. Yes. To it. Barely, you know, 0.9% of what Israel gets. Um, and... Uh, um, and moreover, the weapons that we give, or that's to say sell, um, it, are, are not immediately relevant to the conflict in Gaza. They're, they're military radar, for example, which are more to do with uh, shielding uh, Israel as a whole from rocket, rocket attack from outside. So, of course, everything is linked, but it's not linked to, um, uh, you know... Uh, to mis- let's say misbehavior on the, on the battlefield. Um, so uh, um, so yes. Yeah, so I mean, I I personally would argue, and I think probably this is the position the go- the the government this government will take um, is that. 
uh, actually the present danger to Israel cancels out the possible moral hazard of uh, and the need to protect it mm. from from further attack is uh, probably cancels out um, uh, you know the moral hazard of of um, of British weapons somehow um, you know infl inflaming the war um, but different countries make their decisions uh, and other small small arms deliverers like Canada Netherlands um, Spain have decided to suspend that, that that's an option too that you don't you don't scrap the arms relationship, but you suspend it, or you make it somehow conditional. Uh, um, and they've done that, uh, but really we have to... I, I think Britain's calculations have to be more complex in those countries because one of our, one of our arms exports to Israel goes via America. That's to say we are supplying components um, for fighter jets that America gives, essentially gives to Israel under, uh, you know, under um, uh, their overwhelming uh, arms support for, um, uh, for Israel. So, uh, so you don't want to set up a situation where where Britain makes the delivery of American arms to Israel impossible because we're embargoing it when America mm. isn't. America is the main security provider for Israel and it will always be that way. <clears throat> There's no one else on the ground that, 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 that can do what America does for Israel. So, um, and... Uh, the British government, the present British government, doesn't want to be seen um, uh, messing with that. They they think that's too that 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 is actually an act of of quite uh, quite major diplomatic uh, uh, destruction, really. And just finally, Roger, I wonder what your thoughts are about the current position of Benjamin Netanyahu, because a lot of people said in the immediate aftermath of October the seventh, his reputation was shot, his credibility was shot because he had staked his reputation on being Mr. Security and then he oversaw the greatest security breach in Israel's history. And that is all true. But of course he is the great survivor of Israeli politics. A lot of people thought he'd be gone within months. Here we are, six months on now from October 7th, he's still in post. Yes, there are huge protests against him, but personally it wouldn't surprise me if he was still in post in a year's time or even longer. How do you see his future? Well, I, I I think the Israeli election schedule is that uh, unless <coughs> unless uh, his you know his, his uh, coalition collapses because far right or a few uh, far right supporters um, feel he's not being strong enough and desert the coalition, then and then an election is forced. And if if the schedule is gapped, he's not he's not really due to to go. Uh, for another two years to go to the polls, so um, uh, so there is one theory in Israel, which is that um, uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu wants to keep this war going for as long as possible. Because when the war stops, he will be judged. He'll be judged for his failings that allowed uh, the October seventh attack to go ahead. Um, and for the inadequate peace, because inadequ whatever peace deal is reached, mm. uh, uh, Israel will not be wholly satisfied. Um, and uh, we'll go. And there, there, there's certainly, you can see that there's certainly alternatives shaping up. Um, and <coughs> and it's it's so uh, so it's. Uh, this is one of the interesting confusions about this war is because you've um, uh, he's got a war cabinet um, that is making the key decisions. Um, but implicit in each of their war decisions is this question of what's best for Netanyahu or what's best for his 
competition. Now, part of his competition is Benny Gantz, you know, who used to be a uh, defense minister and is, uh, used to be in the army, you know, senior general. <coughs> and um, uh, so there is this incredible undercurrent of electioneering or, or, or rather a political positioning uh, and uh, war fighting. Um, um, and, an, and, a, and a constant assessment of if we do this, what happens to us? Um, and uh, so it, it's clear that, that this isn't altogether a bad thing. I mean, Netanyahu, uh, you know, the, you can see how the whole discourse about letting in... Um, uh, humanitarian aid convoys has has shifted over the last ten days. Well, clearly that's pressure, pressure from the West. But it's also, um, uh, you know, the message has sunk home that that he's becoming, uh, um, you know, he, he he has the potential to become uh, dead meat. You know, electoral dead meat unless he does two things. Uh, one is not to give up on the hostages, uh, and that has to be really a strong component now of how, of how he goes forward. And the other is um, uh, to assure the world that, that um, you know, he, he's not starving the Gazans to death. Um, uh, and both of these things are linked up with his survival. And and honestly, I I'm, I don't know if he's still got that political uh, nimbleness to to deal with those to deal with those things. I'm I'm wondering if um, if it's not a little bit like Putin and his tunnel vision. You know that that. Actually, um, when when you've got an autocratic, I mean, of course, he's, Israel is a democratic state, but it could be said that that Bibi rules autocratic in an autocratic style, and um, and has been for several years, several decades, uh, and so when when you have so it's a pattern, it's it's a pattern not set by Putin, but is a feature of this so. You could say the same of Erdogan or, you know, or uh, Orban in Hungary or, you know, they're, they're, they, they start making mistakes at the end. When, when uh, there's a, there comes a moment when they lose control of all the key ligaments uh, in the decision-making process. So he used to be good at certain things. He, um, you know, uh, and the Israeli army's reputation is also going down, and this is this is a quite a big, big deal, and it will, it it could lead to, um, the uh, a rather politicized military, um, and it's it's you know it's a citizen army as well as a professional army, and uh, it could be that a, quite a substantial anti uh, Netanyahu vote is contained within the ranks of the army as well so it, so again i'm not giving you a straight answer because there isn't one because it's changing really week by week but um uh but something is happening uh and uh it, i mean netanyahu has to continue till the end of the war but then he could well lose control when it comes to the peace process so and and that's all we're not quite there yet because the shooting is still going on. Roger Boys, really appreciate your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Sorry for rambling. Not at all. <laughs>